Okay, folks. It's 12.30, so let's get started with our uh, last seminar for 2015. We'll hopefully see everybody again in 2016. Today we have kind of a special treat. Uh, Mike met uh, Dr. Basu a few weeks ago at another meeting and learned that he was going to be in town today. And so we were able to reshuffle our, our seminar schedule to uh, make room to have this fascinating presentation on e-waste, which we really don't hear very much about. So Dr. Neil Basu holds a Canada Research Chair in Environmental Health Sciences and he's an Associate Professor at McGill University. Prior to joining McGill, he spent six years on faculty at the University of Michigan School of Public Health and he's currently an adjunct professor there. There. He obtained a Master's of Science degree from UBC where he studied the relationships between chemical pollution and physiological stress responses. The goal of his research is to take an ecosystems approach to community, occupational and environmental health whereby evidence is collected, scrutinized and compared from both humans and ecological organisms. In recent years, Dr. Basu has assumed roles to help build capacity and link academic, government, NGO and industry partners in Ghana and West Africa and he uh, told me just before we started that he's received another five years of funding to pursue this work. So uh, hopefully we're getting an introduction into what's going to be a longer program of research. Welcome, Neil. Great. Thanks for having me. And uh, as I told Mike a few weeks ago, I feel very guilty being here. So it's been 15 years since I've been back to campus. And uh, back in 1999, I got a full scholarship to come here and do my master's in this school. But a month before I came to campus, I had cold feet. And I still came to campus, but I was based in the NCE building across the road, still doing work that I did in my undergrad. So I felt guilty for many, many years. And I told Mike this a few weeks ago, and he said, well, you have to make up for that guilt by coming and speaking here. And then one thing led to another, and I'm here now. But my way of getting back at him, I don't see him here, uh, my way of getting back at him is to talk about the subject e-waste, which I've been studying for a number of years now, but I've actually never formally presented on it. So you're my guinea pigs. Uh, it's just not me. I work with a pretty big team on this, uh, dozens and dozens of people, but these are the core members of our research team. I highlight the first individual who's the chair of the environmental health program at the University of Ghana. I've been working with Prof Fobel for a number of years on a number of environmental and occupational health issues in Ghana and West Africa, and I'll mention those as the talk proceeds. Uh, the other uh, group I want to mention is our uh, US NIH funded, IDRC funded GeoHealth team. And these are some of the members of the team, and they've been instrumental in the work I'm going to talk about today. And again, I'll allude to this program momentarily. This is the program that's going to continue for the next five years. And then uh, I have to acknowledge the WHO and the NIEHS, because they take this e-waste stuff very seriously. And they've been convening a number of international workshops. The last one was this past August in Indonesia, where a couple of us were able to get together to really try to understand what's going on. So this is an outline of my talk today. Uh, again, you're my guinea pigs. I'm going to present upon this for the first time. Uh, so I'm going to broadly talk about e-waste, what it is. I'm going to introduce you to the site, uh, Agwagbloshi, that we've been working in in Accra for a number of years. I'll present some information on some of our recent studies there, and I'll make some concluding remarks. And again, my disclaimer was that this is the first time I'm talking of this issue. So the bottom line, let's start there first. It's not a surprise to any of us that e-waste is a growing problem. Just think about the number of phones that you go through and the computers you go through and appliances you go through. Uh, the latest estimate we have from the United Nations is that 42 million tons was generated in 2014 and the number continues to grow, much of it in the developed world. However, much of it in the developed world does not stay in the developed world. Rather, it gets put into container ships and shipped far, far away to uh, developing world countries, low and middle income countries, many in Asia and many in Africa. And it's largely processed in the informal sector. So this is an informal sector activity. I would say in LMICs, low and middle income countries, more than 90, 95% of this is an informal sector economy activity. And given that it's in the informal sector, it's very hard to regulate and understand. Also, it's not safe. There's really nothing safe about it. Uh, imagine taking these devices, these computer screens and your phones, which are laced with every single element on the periodic table plus some more, and crushing them physically by hand, uh, grinding them, using acids and rudimentary extraction process to pull out the metals that have tremendous value 
but the process in doing that is tremendously risky uh, from an occupational perspective and also an environmental perspective too. And the thing is, we know nothing. Well, we know very little about what's going on. Uh, we hear a lot about this in the media, as I'll mention momentarily, but we really know very little about the relevant exposures, the types of hazards, the vulnerable populations at risk, and overall our ability to assess the risks associated with e-waste is highly, highly limited. So what is e-waste? Uh, there are two definitions that are worth mentioning. The first one is uh, uh, EEE, which is electrical and electronic equipment. So basically anything with a plug. If it's got a plug, it's EEE. What converts that EEE to e-waste is if you discard it. Okay, so very simply, anything with a plug has the potential to be e-waste. And this is a diagram. I don't know how well it came out, but it uh, distinguishes EEE -E -E from e-waste. So again, anything you have with a plug, uh, it's manufactured, you buy it, you use it. Uh, maybe you discard it. Sometimes it gets recycled. As long as it's functional and in use, it's workable EEE. -E -E. As long as it's functional and in use, we use it here. As soon as we decide that thing does not function anymore, and especially in a country like Canada or the US, uh, I think we're too quick to just, oh, it doesn't work, let's just throw it away. We do a lot of that. And uh, it gets discarded. And sometimes it can get reused here internally, and then it goes back into the commercial uh, uh, circuit here. Sometimes it gets recycled or disposed of. It turns into e-waste in this case. A lot of times this stuff is deemed to be reusable. It's put onto container ships sent far, far away to low- and middle-income countries. They receive it. They can't fix it. It turns into e-waste. Other times, the junk is just sent there. So there is a distinction between workable and unworkable electrical objects. So there are a couple reasons we should con uh, be concerned. The first one is the volume. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, right now, the latest estimates are that over 40 million tons of e-waste has been generated. And we can see a steady increase from 2010 to going into the future. And, uh, I don't know, when I see numbers like this, I always wonder how they calculated it. And when you look at the ways that they came up with these numbers, fine, there's a scientific method associated with it, but the foundational numbers are just lacking. And I can't help but think that these numbers are much, much greater. They don't do a good job of accounting for all the electrical products being used in low and middle income countries. For those of you that have spent time uh, in Africa or in Asia, they have a lot more electronic gadgets than we do. We should care number two because we're addicted to these things. Has anyone heard the term nomophobe? Because you're all nomophobes, I bet. Does anyone know what nomophobe stands for? I just learned this. Any guesses? Yeah, so no mobile phone phobia. OK, so no mobile phone phobia. If you Google search this, you'll see a number of great cartoons. I came across this one. You can do the, the quiz yourself. And I bet you most of you are addicted. Okay, I bet you most of you are addicted. And there is actually scientific studies going on on this topic right now um, where hundreds of people are being surveyed, where they ask questions about stress associated with losing your cell phone. And the data are quite interesting to look at. And I think each of us represent an individual case where when we lose our phones or we lose our devices, we panic. So we're addicted. Uh, we often think about e-waste in terms of cell phones, but it's a lot more than cell phones. So given my definition earlier, what other things are we thinking of? Any guesses as to what the greatest contributor to e-waste is worldwide? Television sets. Television sets are up there. Any other guesses? Batteries. Batteries. Yeah, it's these smaller electronic devices. So. Um, of the 40 or so million tons, uh, less than 10% are cell phones, keyboards, mice, printers. But if you look at small equipment, if you look at large equipment, things like television sets, microwaves, the screens in computers, uh, these constitute the bulk of the e-waste. So again, we hear a lot about e-waste in the news. The, 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 the blame is usually put on things like computers and screens and cell phones. But they're just a small, yet significant part of the story. There are many other types of things that have plugs that we should be concerned about, too. Okay. We should also care because it's a really sensitized issue. We hear about it in the media a lot. 
And there's actually a lot of really fascinating and somewhat scary art if you look into this uh, topic. And this is just a picture of one from an American artist. Uh, UBC did a fantastic job. Does anyone know the story from UBC? Yeah, so uh, it was what, back in 2009, uh, there were some professors in the journalism school who took a bunch of journalism students to the Agba Bloshi site, which I'll talk about momentarily. Uh, what they did is they bought a hard drive for $40, and they later found out when they plugged that hard drive in, that was a hard drive from a big U.S. defense contractor, a multi-million dollar U.S. defense contractor, and inside that hard drive there was stuff that shouldn't be there. Okay, so it was a great expose, CBC, CNN, uh, UBC journalism students, and then these students and their professors then actually put together this wonderful documentary in PBS, in their frontline program, uh, called uh, The Digital Dumping Ground. So it's worth looking at. It's somewhat sensational, but it really does a decent job of painting the picture of the scene on the ground. Okay? So good job, UBC. I care, because it's a personal issue. So two of these are mine. You can probably guess who they are. And this summer, my wife and I were playing soccer, as we usually do. And we look over, and we see my two sons with these two kids in a pile of e-waste. And we asked them what, what, what drew them to it. And all oh, these wires, these things, they cling and clang. And you can make the, like Lego devices, so on and so forth. And fine, these are my kids. Um, the fact is, if you go to an e-waste site, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of kids that roam around just like this. On one hand, there's a big child labor issue where a lot of these kids are doing the work. On the other hand, much of this work happens in communities where kids live there. And kids have great curiosity. They see things like this, they're attracted to it, they want to play with it. My kids certainly did. These kids worldwide certainly do as well. And uh, I don't have to tell an audience like this that kids are not little adults, that kids have unique sensitivities when it comes to environmental and occupational health hazards. We should care because of all the occupational and environmental health dangers. Uh, there's a whole suite of organic chemicals, inorganics. Some of these are legacy, such as PCBs, which we seem to think of as an old story. Well, a lot of these devices have PCBs built into them. What we're doing now is we're dumping them all into one place and concentrating the PCB issue. In addition to PCBs, many, many different types of metals, the usual suspects, such as like the mercury, the cadmium, the leads, and the chromiums, but also some of these newer chemicals, like the rare earth elements, uh, these really, really fascinating chemicals which power most of our devices, for which we know very little about. Uh, they're emerging substances like flame retardants, which ensure that the, the, the screens and our computers don't burn. Uh, most of these are proven toxicants. There's, we know enough about all these chemicals, maybe except for the REEs, that they're toxic. And they're toxic at levels that matter. We see good epi studies on populations associating exposures to these types of chemicals with real-world type effects that we care about. Uh, most are persistent, most bioaccumulate, meaning that we're concentrating them in these sites. Uh, they degrade, they're, they're transformed, they're utilized, but they sort of sit there and they sort of build up in the ecosystem. What we don't know is when you hap what happens when you put them together. So we know very little about chemical mixtures, and even worse than that, we know little about chemical-non-chemical -chemical interactions. Uh, when I say non-chemical, I'm talking about the unique social environment in which these people live. So generally poor people, malnourished people, low socioeconomic status. These are all supposed to confound or exacerbate chemically induced uh, health effects, but we just know very little about these interactions. So there's a real natural experiment uh, occurring in front of us in many sites around the world. On the other hand, we care about these, and especially the people that do it. So oftentimes, we somewhat vilify the industry, but we have to realize that it occurs in low- and middle-income countries for the most part, where people are relatively poor, and that this is a source of income. It's a tremendous source of income. And in fact, the estimate suggests that every single year, uh, about 48 uh, uh, million euros is recovered in these informal sector type activities. And that's tremendous amounts of money for people that work in these types of environments. And this is just a list of the various types of uh, elements or entities that are recovered from electronic waste and their estimated value. Okay, So there's tremendous value associated with this. We view it as a new form of mining, like modern mining. 
Uh, it's so much easier to do this and in going into the ground and grabbing rocks and ore and crushing them. Rather, we have everything sort of already brought from the earth. There must be a better way to process it. So it's a new form of mining that we're viewing called urban mining. And a lot of the precious elements that we need for modern day society are in these things with plugs. So I want to shift attention to our work at Agbuk Bloshi. Um, what I want to first do is mention the tremendous upsurge in the number of studies on e-waste in the last few years. So there's been many, many media reports. And I would say there's a growing number of academic papers. Uh, last year, there was over 200 published. In the grand scheme of things, it's really not that much. But we can see a tremendous increase. Uh, look at the turn of uh, the, the around 2000, maybe like five papers published on the topic. So this is really a new uh, issue. It's new for scientists and it's new for society. If you then look at the countries that have been publishing, number one is China. So there's a massive e-waste issue in China, which I'm not going to talk about today. But that's where the e-waste problem, if you look at the world, really lies. Uh, a lot of the e-waste is exported to China. And China has a lot of their own uh, domestic e-waste that they're processing. It's massive business in China. Um, if you look down the rest of the list, a lot of papers being published by folks from uh, the Global North, so researchers from the US, Japan, the UK. Uh, these are largely people who go down to low and middle income countries and do research and come back and publish on the findings. But at the bottom is Ghana. So there are a number of Ghanaians who have been studying the issue, who've uh, been starting to take it seriously, who've been banding together. And that's the story I'm going to focus on now. So, the Agua Bloshi site was actually made, uh, it was brought to the limelight because of that UBC expose. And ever since then, it just keeps on popping up in those top 10 surveys of the world's polluted sites. So every year, some NGO will come up with their survey of what the top 10 polluted sites are. I have no idea how they come up with these, but Agua Bloshi almost always makes it. So look at any of those surveys, and you'll see the Ghana site. And this is just one picture from it. Um, so this is a picture of the site. Um, here's a map of central Accra. This is the Pacific Ocean, uh, sort of the Atlant uh, Atlantic Ocean, yep, <laughs> the Gulf of Guinea. And uh, this is central Accra right here on the sort of the eastern edge of it. So this is the central rain rail station. The central business district is located in this area. And just to the west of it is this swath of land right here. So there's a stream to the left, a river to the right, and right in here is what's uh, currently known as an area of land that's occupied by the Greater Accra Scrap Workers Association. So this is where most of the e-waste activities are. But realize for decades, if not about a century, this is where much of the waste has been processed in the country. I'm not talking about like refuse and garbage. Um, I'm talking about fridges and anything with a plug. So it's been long viewed as a place to take your appliances where they will get recycled. Um, the thing to notice here is that it's just a few kilometers from the central business district. And all these areas are where people live. Okay, So you have this massive electronic waste site in which all these products and all these chemicals are being, um, um, they're being centralized. And then immediately surrounding the region are families, homes, residences, and schools, and many, many workers. Okay, so the site sits amongst the city. The last point is important. The site's accessible. Uh, earlier, I alluded to the issue being vast and grand in China, which it is. But it's very difficult to access those sites. Um, many of those sites are now controlled by the government or by the mafia. And it's almost impossible for researchers to go in. Uh, there are sites in Nigeria. There are sites in South America. There are other sites around the world that we know of that are just not accessible. Because either they're criminalized, controlled by uh, illicit groups, or the government won't let you in because it's bad press. The Ghana site is still quite open. And uh, my colleague Julius has been working there for a good seven years. He has a great relationship with the Scrap Worker Dealers Association. There's actually like a union. Uh, it's informal activity, but there's a union, if that makes sense. But uh, uh, there is a group that oversees activities there. We have a good relationship with them. Uh, there are a number of NGOs on the ground there who I'll allude to later. And um, uh, uh, surrounding the site is actually a number of the Ministry of Health offices too. So folks in the Ministry of Health are involved in these projects too. So it seems like we have all the key stakeholders 
involved and open to doing research and trying to improve the situation on the ground, which makes this site very accessible and very primed to doing the types of projects that we need to do. So this is a picture taken of the site in the year 2000. Recall that was a time when uh, uh, there was very little known about uh, e-waste, at least on the academic side. Uh, this is before that UBC expose. And again, this is the river that goes on the east side of it. This is the stream on the west side of it. There's a massive field here. There are trees and forests. And much of the scrap was dealt with some industries on this side of the road. And uh, you can see a couple of shacks and huts here where a lot of the Back then, I suppose there were fridges or car tires or maybe small appliances were being processed. So this is uh, in the year 2000. And these are Google satellite images. This is eight years later. This is around the time when those UBC students went there. You can see much greater scarring of the land. The, the trees are largely gone here. Uh, the community here has grown significantly because a lot of the people that do e-waste live right here across the lagoon, uh, the river. Uh, you can see the activities uh, are not just along the road now, but they started to move inwards. Uh, they've retained their little soccer pitch right here. Uh, but the activities have grown tremendously in eight years. And then this is last year, which uh, just shows further expansion of both the, the, the residences in the area as well as the activity. And if you go now, uh, this is about, uh, I'm going to guess maybe uh, like a kilometer or so to walk. And it's pretty much all littered with uh, electronic waste of some sort or another, and a lot of garbage, too. Um, the site is actually quite uh, organized. And I think that's my next slide, yeah. So um, it's quite organized. So there is a Scrap Dealers Workers Association who really limit access to the site. Depending on who you are, uh, you're binned into different work categories. And different work categories have different benefits associated with it, and also risks and hazards, too. Um, I'll talk momentarily about the different types of workers and some of the complications with this. But to be very, very simple, there are four main work classifications here. They're people that essentially deal in this stuff and collect this stuff. So they're buyers. They collect this stuff. They amass this stuff. They're largely operating on the fringes on the outside. Okay, So things are coming in from the big roads and highways. The dealers and collectors buy it. Next, they sell it off into... Uh, uh, I don't know, like these little uh, corporations exist within the, the site in which a corporation will have dealers linked with sorters and dismantlers and burners. Uh, the sorters will next take the different types of materials that have been purchased and sort them into components, work with the dismantlers to actually break them apart. Okay, So you want to really sort things, dismantle them, because that eases the process in terms of extracting the chemicals um, that you want. And the, the final part is burning. A lot of the things have to be burned. That's just the easiest way to get to the elements. It's much easier to burn uh, a phone or plastics to get to what you want, because then you're left with the residual elements, which usually don't burn off. And that's usually done in the fields down here by the river. Okay, So dealers and collectors are on the fringes, usually in the periphery. Uh, the sorting happens just off the edge of the road. Dismantling occurs just inside the formal site. And burning occurs in the fields here along the river. So uh, let's see. Yeah, so here's a picture of folks dealing and collecting. So usually lots of gr uh, groups of people together. Uh, there are women mixed in here with children. A lot of it's done with men. Uh, they're uh, collecting a lot of stuff. They're buying a lot of stuff. They're on the fringes. This is what the scene looks like. Um, sorting is exactly what you think it would be. It's, uh, this is not the best picture of sorting, but there are really nice examples of things being nicely sorted into their components. Uh, here you can see there's a... Uh, um, uh, a basin on the upper left, and you've got piles of different stuff, which will then move into different bigger collections. Uh, the next thing to do is dismantle it. This happens actually inside the site. Uh, what you can see here is that it's all manually done. Uh, there's absolutely no personal protection being used. Um, it's all done by hand and primitive tools. That's how the dismantling is done. And then the last thing is burning. It happens on the river, uh, and uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, there are always plumes of smoke coming off this site. And these plumes of smoke are moving largely in this direction, which goes right over the central business district. Okay? So again, a big capital city in Africa. There are tremendous concerns over air pollution. Uh, it's further exacerbated by a site like this, which is releasing air pollution like this, which are loaded with all the things that I'm sure Professor Brower has taught you about. But to add to that, there's going to be flame retardants in them. There's going to be PCBs. There's going to be metals. It's just a toxic soup being released into the air. 
Any questions thus far? Yes. Yeah. Good question. Not to my knowledge, no. No one's characterized the smoke coming off, but hopefully we will in the next few years, which I'll explain near the end. In the back? Yeah, so I'm not sure in a day. Uh, the estimate that I see, which just boggles my mind, and I'm not sure how I believe it or how they came up with it, but is that there are 40,000 workers in the area. Uh, I've been there dozens and dozens of times, and at any given time I see anywhere from um, on Easter, People were working, and there were maybe 100 people, uh, upwards of thousands. So, uh, but the number that I hear is 40,000 people work there regularly. Okay. But again, I'm not quite sure how those numbers were derived. Okay. Yes? They do. Yeah. Good question. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation as to where that money is actually used. And uh, uh, that's supposed to be used to recycle internally here. I'm not exactly sure how that plays out. And as I mentioned before, I'm, I've been working on this topic for two or three years, but that's one of the issues that I just need to learn more about. Uh, I also think it's just not clear. These laws vary uh, uh, from North America, Canada versus the U.S. to the European Union, and it's just not clear. And uh, to me, it's not certain. I, I, at McGill, there are these bins everywhere which tell you that they'll recycle your e-waste. I'm not convinced that they recycle anything. I have a colleague who can put GPS trackers on stuff, so we're trying to throw in a bunch of old computers to see where they really go. So. <laughs> Okay, so I mentioned earlier that the Ghanaians are quite uh, prolific at research. And uh, this is what brought me to Ghana many, many years ago to work on broader environmental and occupational health issues, which I'll talk about near the end of it. And in recent years, they've taken this expertise they have in their universities and also in their government to publish on topics. So they published more than 30 papers just describing human health issues, ecological issues, and socioeconomic issues. So there's a growing uh, foundation of work from that site and a growing number of researchers that we can start working more closely with, many of who have been working with us. So I just wanted to mention that there is some evidence and capacity. Uh, but there remain a number of knowledge gaps. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is my biased list. Uh, these are a lot of the questions that uh, we've started to address recently, uh, but also are the types of things that we're going to pursue over the next five years with this USNIH slash IDRC grant we have called GeoHealth. So GeoHealth stands for Global Environmental and Occupational Health. Uh, the, the, the premise behind GeoHealth is that there are a number of environmental and occupational health issues in low and middle income countries. And we've got to get away from uh, the fact that a lot of the studies done in those areas is done by folks in North America or Europe going in, doing helicopter work, and coming back. Uh, we need to strengthen capacity in these regions. So to do so, uh, part of the grant is focused on strengthening uh, tertiary educational systems in country. Part of the grant is to offer uh, better research projects in the country. Part of the grant is to provide stipends for in-country, in-regional researchers to stay in the countries and in the regions and work on the topic. So this is something we've been doing for a number of years, and we're renewed for the next five years. And over the years, we've been able to train, I think, 12, 15 postdocs, and maybe 30 master's students, and 20 or so PhDs, all Ghanaian or West African, to stay in the region. We have the West African node. There's an East African node. There is uh, uh, an Asian node, there are a couple in Latin America. So there are about seven or eight in the world that the NIEHS or the NIH has been sponsoring for a good four or five years now. And recently, IDRC in Canada has brought some money to the table. So this is a joint NIH-IDRC venture. Moving ahead with it, uh, each of these nodes around the world is asked to strengthen in-region capacity by focusing in on a, an issue that's of importance to the region that can be used as a living learning laboratory. And for us, it's Agwibloshi. So this will be the site that the Ghanaian scholars come to, that the scholars from across West Africa, Anglophone and Francophone researchers come to, so we can all work together on this issue. And then moving ahead, the goal is for folks that come from Benin or Cote d'Ivoire or Mali, that they'll go back and we'll work with them to launch studies in their own countries, because e-waste is occurring everywhere. So uh, in terms of our studies, uh, since 2011, we've been doing a number of what I call almost like boutique, small-scale studies there. 
Uh, and this is just typical of working in such sites. I've been working in e-waste for a few years now. I've been working on other mining issues. And we sell them. We never get a chance to uh, recruit hundreds or thousands of people. It's always a couple dozen here, and maybe a hundred there for lucky. So we sort of start coupling all these together to build a weight of evidence. So this is just a snapshot of the types of studies we've been able to do over the last few years. Uh, the focus, the types of exposures or outcomes we've been able to measure. And again, each study is limited. Uh, it's unfortunately the best that we can do given the conditions. Uh, but when you start putting it all together, the conclusions are quite, quite similar. The nice thing with the GeoHealth project is that we have funds now to do a longitudinal study. We'll uh, bring in workers and be able to interact with them uh, on an ongoing basis. So much of the work that I do in my lab comes to a conceptual framework that revolves around the exposure disease model. And this is the model that we're using for much of our work. And I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here. But the idea is to understand what the sources of contaminants are. Um, I'm going to largely focus on contaminants, but we are looking at injuries and other physical hazards, noise exposure, uh, accidents and injuries, so on and so forth. Uh, so you take these hazards, what are the source of the hazards, do try to understand the environmental fate, where does it go, does it get into the air, the water, or the soil, so we'll characterize all those ecosystem components, uh, do detailed human exposure studies, um, and then work with our team of health professionals to look at health outcomes. And only by doing that, you can link it back to source. So in the end, we want to intervene. We certainly want to make sure that we can improve the conditions on the ground. But we can't do that without knowing the hazards. What hazards are causing what kind of exposures or causing what kind of health effects? Where can we really intervene? So we really need to take this exposure disease model and connect the dots. So I'm going to go through three examples of studies we've done recently to give you a taste of uh, what we've been able to uncover. Um, a couple of years ago, we did an ecological study. We sampled soil. We sampled water and sediment. Soil is in the brown squares. Uh, the blue circles are the water samples, and the yellow pins are the sediments. I'll briefly just present the soil data for you. My grad student just uh, crunched this a few days ago, so this can be quite limited. Uh, on the x-axis are a number of metals that were measured in soil or sediment. The y-axis is the concentration of the things in part per billion. Uh, notice that it's on a log scale. So uh, the, I mean, there's tremendous differences across the metals, but also within the metals. Um, and then each bar represents a different part of the UA site. I just want to draw your attention to lead, which is in the middle. Um, the bar at the beginning and the bar at the end, we can view them as our control sites. These are sites outside the e-way facility. So you can see the sites in the facility, the three middle bars, are an order of magnitude higher in terms of the lead content than those outside the site. So that's just one take-home message. And we see that from a number of others, uh, for a number of the other metals. Uh, when we compare the actual uh, uh, mean values to the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment, they have a guideline value for soil quality, which uh, is used to protect ecosystem health. Uh, every time there's a little symbol like this, that particular sample exceeds the value. Okay, so there are a number of samples that would be higher than what we would deem to be acceptable here in Canada. This is not surprising at all. And what I can also tell you is that there's a lot of variability across these samples, too. And in pretty much all these cases, there's going to be a sample or two that exceeds the guideline values. So these are just the mean values we're comparing. So again, there are a number of elements. They're largely elevated in the e-waste site. But across all the e-waste sites and across all the elements and even some of the controls, there are going to be little hot spots of contamination. When we look at the concentrations of metals in the soil or sediment at the Agba Gloshi site, and compared to two sites in India, the first two bars are two sites in China for cadmium, copper, chromium, lead, and zinc. Um, Agba Gloshi is the final bar. It's a log scale again. In general, the concentrations are similar. So that gives us some confidence that what's going on at Agba Gloshi is not that dissimilar from what's going on in other e-way sites. So I think this is important to try to put this site into broader context. Okay, so the concentrations we're seeing at the Ghana site are not too, too different from sites in other parts of the world. Okay, so I want to shift from the ecological study to the worker study. Uh, in 2014, we had a very small study on 58 workers. Their mean age was 26, but the range was quite, quite high. Uh, a third were single, a third were married and living together, some were married and living apart, some were separate. Uh, most of them were Muslim, 
And uh, I'm not sure if people know much about West Africa or Ghana, but uh, Muslims live in the north and Catholics live in the south. Um, but what happens here is that there are very few job opportunities in the north. So many from the north will migrate down to the south. And word up in the north is that urban mining is taking off in the city. So many Muslims from the north come down into the south and live in this community. So you have this pocket of uh, northern Muslims who live in central Accra. And I think that raises a number of other social issues that need to be studied and understood. Uh, in terms of their income, uh, about two-thirds earn less than $7 Canadian a day. Uh, on one hand, it's good because it's most than what the poorest of the poor earn, so maybe $1 to $2 a day uh, much of the country earns. But in fact, the national average in Ghana is about $30 a day. Uh, there's tremendous variability. There's extreme wealth in this country, like in many other low- and middle-income countries. So it just gives you a sense of what the income is for this group. Uh, largely, if they weren't doing e-waste, they'd be getting by on a dollar or two a day. So this is a significant increase in income for them. Uh, in terms of school, half have no schooling. The rest have some kind of schooling. And in terms of e-waste years working at the site, five years on average. Okay, this is not that different from what I showed you earlier in terms of sort of the progression of that site. But again, there was that 68-year-old who had been working there for 50 years. So he started at the age of 18, uh, and he's worked on things in the past that had electrical plugs. Okay. So in terms of what they do, this this gets messy, uh, and uh, it was a struggle for us to come up with a good survey initially. So we failed on that completely. And the next studies will be informed by this one. So it's just a classic thing in science that we learn from one study and improve the next one. So when we designed the first study, there were more than 10 activities that people reported to be doing. And in many cases, they're doing more than one. So it becomes so, so difficult to blame one activity for one kind of hazard exposure and one kind of risk. Uh, you need to realize that most people are there are doing many different things. But when we look at the data closer, it seems to be that people generally do prefer one activity over another. So somehow we came up with a strategy to bin people into a primary work category, which I know this will change next time we do it, but this is the best we have for this study, in which half the people are dismantling, um, maybe a quarter are sorting and dealing, and very few do the burning. Okay, So very, very few do the burning. Uh, when we think about the media reports and other studies, it's the burning that gets the attention. Okay, so just remember that for a second. Because when we look at the concentrations of metals in these workers, um, it's the burners that have the highest levels of most things. So let me walk you through this. So uh, we, we took the group of 60 or so workers. We classified them very simply as those that mainly deal, mainly sort, mainly dismantle, or mainly burn. And then we looked at a number of elements in their blood and also in their urine. So we did a biomonitoring study. And then the values here represent the concentrations in part per billion. And uh, th the numbers really don't mean anything for this presentation. I just want you to, to point out that red means that they have higher, like the highest concentration in a very simple group-wise comparison. And in the end, those that do the burning have the highest concentrations of most elements, followed by those that do the dismantling. Again, very few exclusively burn. Uh, maybe a quarter dismantle, but again, realize that some people are doing more than one job type. So moving ahead in our next studies, we have to design better ways of capturing what they're actually doing and better understand what like, proportion of their time they're spending doing what. Okay. <clears throat> so the third thing I want to introduce to you is a study that one of the, our master's students did this summer, and it's to really understand, well, we're starting to build up some evidence of environmental exposures, ecological contamination, uh, occupational issues, uh, some social issues others are uncovering, but what to do next? There have been some interventions tried at the site which have failed. So we need to start talking to the stakeholders and understanding what the various dimensions are, what the various options are, and what the barriers are. So in the past few years, uh, we've been using the Delphi method to try to uncover some of these uh, ways forward. So Delphi is a method in which uh, it uses a structured, facilitated discussion format uh, to gain consensus on uh, complicated issues and to prioritize response or even policy options. Uh, the way that this happened, again, was a, this was a limited study too, of 19 key stakeholders from either the government, either workers. Uh, they were part of the Scrap Dealers Association, researchers from 15 different institutions. 
Uh, the students interviewed them in a uh, sort of an open and closed survey format. They took all that information then created an online poll. Uh, the online poll came up with sort of 12 options. So based on the interviews, there were 12 options that sort of trickled to the top on what could be done. So the, the, word, the, the options are phrased like this. So based on evidence or judgment or knowledge, it is recommended that this, this, and this happen. Okay, so each option was a specific idea for moving ahead. And instead of simply asking them if this option is good or not, we broke it apart into benefit and feasibility. So is the option going to be beneficial? But not just beneficial in broad terms, but beneficial to people, to society, to the environment, and to the economy. And a lot of these things are beneficial. They sound great. But then when you ask them if it's feasible or not, that's when things really get interesting. Uh, and then feasibility can be broken apart into uh, political will, uh, social feasibility, are people going to accept this? Economic feasibility, can we afford this? And can be implemented. So by doing this, gives a deeper picture on the options, but also which are the options that are the most beneficial and which have the least barriers. Uh, these were scored with a Likert scale in an online poll where we had, uh, these are very high or high, low, very low. And the thing to point out here is that neutral was removed. Because we really wanted people to have an opinion. This is an example of the results. These, in fact, are the top four options uncovered this past summer. Um, number one was that everyone recognized that further research was needed. Number two, uh, I was surprised by this one, but that e-workers need basic personal protective equipment. In a lot of other places that we work, for some reason, people don't favor PPE. But in this case, they really wanted some basic PPE. So uh, uh, closed boots, hard-toed boots, uh, maybe even some uh, uh, hard hats and stuff. Uh, there was uh, some uh, interest on the hazardous waste bill. So there's a Ghana, a national hazardous waste bill that's been tabled for a number of years now. But with changing government, it just keeps on getting tabled. So folks really want this bill to be revisited. And uh, there's also a belief that the e-waste worker's voice is not being heard. Uh, so in the past few years, there have been a number of NGOs and uh, groups coming into the site because, again, there's been great media interest coming into the site with magical solution A or intervention number B. And what we do is we go there and we see the remnants of this intervention, which themselves turn into e-waste. So there are cases, cases of these like magical devices that are going to improve um, the processing of the stuff, which have a plug or batteries, and they're just not used at all. So we have to understand the barriers for these. Why are they not being used? And it's really important to engage the local workers to look at this more holistically. So we hope a survey like this will start doing that. So in summary for the research stuff, what I just presented to you were a series of studies that we've been doing. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that each one in themselves is somewhat limited. But I think when you start bundling them together, bundle them with the work others are doing in the area, uh, bundle them with studies being done in a couple other parts of the world, we're starting to see, yeah, the ecosystem is contaminated. Soil, sediment, water, fish, vegetables. I didn't mention that there's a major market beside this place. There are fish in the river that people consume. These are all contaminated. Uh, not surprisingly, workers are being exposed, at least in this site, to metals and pH, as we've seen. Uh, the data are very, very messy and highly variable. So that's something we need to tackle in our uh, upcoming studies. And the stakeholder perspectives are critical moving ahead. So I spent the last week on campus here talking about ASGM, so artisanal small-scale gold mining. We had a three or four-day workshop that some of your professors in the mining school organized. And it was a wonderful experience where 50 people around the world were brought in to talk about the Minmata Convention, which is this convention that's unfolding before our eyes to regulate mercury. And I spent a lot of my time studying mercury. And that I could talk about for hours and hours. So, so I want to talk about e-waste to change uh, focuses a little bit. Uh, and if this convention actually works, in 10 or 20 years, I should not be studying mercury. So that's one way I've started to switch to e-waste, thinking that mercury is going to hopefully in 10, 20 years not be an issue. I need to figure out what's next. So that's why I'm shifting to e-waste. But with that being said, there was a great presentation given by Richard from Ban Toxic, which he uncovered this quote to me from Mary Ritter Baird, who is this activist uh, feminist from the US from the 1800s. And the quote is very simple, and you can read it, that action without study is fatal, and study without action is futile. And I think that really speaks to the type of work that we're doing here. Um, study without action is futile. I think in a lot of cases, we do research studies, but we don't translate that into action. So we feel very, very strongly that we need to have a strong, robust evidence base to inform action. 
With that being said, as I mentioned on the previous slide, there are a number of groups coming in with magical solutions or ideas for intervention that are just not informed by evidence. And that's fatal too. So it's important for scientific research to occur to understand the conditions on the ground from all perspectives, social, economic, environmental, ecological, human health, to inform the actions. So I think moving ahead that this is where we really want to push work at the site. And in terms of next steps, this is just a list of the different types of projects that we're going to do in the next few years. So expand the types of exposures we're looking at. A couple on the team have strong backgrounds in air pollution, so we'll start looking more at that aspect, and air pollution related or even toxic metal related issues to cardiovascular health and respiratory outcomes. Uh, a longitudinal studies um, under works right now. Uh, as I alluded to, we have regional partners coming in from a number of West African countries where they have e-waste. So we want to launch multi-country comparative studies. And then we want to link up with those pursuing the interventions. Many of them we've been talking with already. They realize that their actions are futile. They see their like, magical solutions not being used. And they're starting to realize that they need to work closely with researchers. Us as researchers also realize that our, our like, scientific findings need to sort of fuel that end of the spectrum. Uh, we'll continue to push uh, action-oriented dialogue. So at the local level, the scrap worker dealers associations on board, uh, they believe in healthy workers. Healthy workers is better for their bottom line. Healthy workers is better for uh, the situation on the ground. So that's good. At the national level, the country of Ghana has this bill tabled. Let's hopefully they can push that forward. And internationally, there are a number of things like the Basel Convention that are starting to now consider expanding their scope to capture e-waste. Earlier, there was a question about what the fine print really means. And uh, now with the uh, uh, Minamata Convention in my head all the time and thinking of conventions and international uh, ways of sort of dealing with these global issues, I'm going to start trying to learn more about uh, sort of the global convention scene when it comes to e-waste. And then as I mentioned before, this is really, I mean, it's really important for the issue of e-waste uh, nationally, locally, and globally. But it also represents a great training ground to train students in the region and faculty to look at those key uh, skills and disciplines in environmental and occupational health. So just as a final remark, again, just a reminder that e-waste is here to stay. 42 million tons now. It's going to increase for the unforeseeable future. A lot of this occurs in resource-limited settings where the capacity just does not exist to, to be able to process in a safe and prosperous manner. Uh, the process is unsafe. Um, all the studies show us that there is contamination there. I don't think there's a single study that shows a lack of contamination. But despite the contamination, we know very little about what these exposures mean for health, especially in the sort of the, the, the resource-limited setting, the low socioeconomic status, the malnourished environment in which these occur. Uh, actions are occurring, but as I mentioned, they're not really informed by research studies. So we need to really better link um, the research side with folks doing work on the ground. So with that being said, these are all the people I want to thank and the funding agencies for this project. And if there are any questions, that's my email address. And I'd be glad to take any right now, or you can shoot me an email later. Thanks. Any questions? Yes, in the front. <clears throat> Thanks, Neil. Very interesting studies you got going. Um, the toxic effects of some of these newer, more exotic sort of metals, have they been studied to any great extent? Uh, so in terms of the newer chemicals, things like flame retardants and phthalates have received a lot of attention recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can target multiple physiological systems in the body. I think the greatest concern is with endocrine disruption, that these things have been shown to cause endocrine disrupting effects. Uh, you mentioned metals in your questions. I wasn't sure if you're talking about the rare earth elements. Yes. For those, I think we know very, very little. We know very, very little. There are a handful of animal studies. Uh, there are a couple occupational studies, uh, but I don't think there are any epi studies looking at populations. So I think the there is great uncertainty over those metals, even from basic things like exposure assessments to where they go in the body. Who is actually buying the metals from them? And how do the different categories, the DO and the, 
the deal and connect, the sort, dismantle, and burn, how do they get paid? Do you yeah, good question. So who's buying the metals? Uh, this is not that different from the other mining projects I'm with. If you ask people who's buying your stuff, they can tell you who's buying it. They can't tell you who's buying from them. So they're, we're aware generally of sort of one degree of separation. And in this case, there are buyers. There are people in the country who buy these things. And they either sell it domestically or they export it again. I'm not quite sure, though. I don't think we've been able to connect the dots on this issue in such a manner. Um, and then your other question was, uh, how, yeah, yeah. So they're largely organized into teams, and uh, in each team, each team runs like a little company. And depending on experience and depending on the type of job, uh, there's a value associated with it. And uh, I can't remember off the top of my head which category gets the most, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Basu. I was just wondering if your team um, has noticed any trend on any um, diseases or impacts that these pol this pollution may be having on the local community? Yeah, we, unfortunately we haven't. Uh, in terms of trends, uh, we just don't have a number of years to be able to string this together. And every year is a cross-sectional study. So we're hoping that this longitudinal study will let us delve deeper into individuals and track their health over time. Even still, if we find something, it's going to be really challenging to tease apart the causal determinants of that. Um, a study like this is it's, it's epi. And there are a number of factors that could explain what we see. And the sample sizes are going to be low. And in the end, um, it's going to be, I think, too, too difficult to tease apart the chemicals from the non-chemical stressors. So I think we're all a bit pessimistic. But I think that's fair. I mean, I, I just don't, it's going to be difficult to really figure out which chemicals and which activity are causing the greatest impacts. But what we're hoping we can do is by looking at this study, maybe a couple other sites to start to hone in that type of question. Hello, thank you. Um, where would you characterize the local government in this situation, are they aware of this? Or is this a lack of capacity or a lack of will? Or how would, how would you phrase that? Yeah, so they're definitely aware because all their office is around the corner. So they see this. Uh, they're also aware. I would say the Ghanaian government's quite progressive when it comes to environment and health. Uh, there is this Libreville Declaration in Africa uh, that was signed by all the ministers of health and the environment maybe a couple of years ago, in which the continent recognizes that health and the environment are intimately linked. The estimates in Africa are that 25% of health outcomes are due to modifiable or preventable environmental hazards. So the, the continent recognizes that. And I think Ghana really recognizes that. They've been ahead of the game in the sense that they've had this hazardous bill waste, uh, this hazardous waste bill sitting um, in their parliament for a number of years. But with changing governments, it just keeps on getting punted to the next government. I think the hope is with the next government that they'll actually start pushing this through, especially with the data emerging at Agbogloshi. So I think people remain optimistic. Um, a number of our partners occupy like, the leading positions in the Ministry of Health or Environment. And they're all on board on the projects. They're aware of all the issues. And they're strong advocates for this. So uh, I feel quite optimistic that things will move ahead there. Thank you. Uh, I know quite a bit about the site. Okay. Uh, we did other works there on women's health and things like that. Great. And it's true, most of the people move from the north, and they are young people. Mm -hmm. So even dealing with something like longitudinal long study will be a problem, because they come in there as a starting point, make some money, they move out. Yeah. So when we look at even health of perceived health for those people in there, it seems to even have better health than people living in well-organized neighborhood. Just because they are much younger, they come in fresh, work for few. They had better health. Yes, yes and yeah. just move out. Fair enough. Yeah, uh, but on the question, um, Getting that side very organized has been quite political mm -hmm. uh, in many ways. And each government comes and tries to evict the people, clean up the place. Then the opposition says, no way, you can't do that. That is mm -hmm. not social. You have to you know, relocate them properly. Then becomes 
big issue, then they leave it for the other government. And there are two main governments in Ghana uh, mm -hmm. for the past many years, just like the U.S. Democrat versus the Republican kind of thing. But uh, whoever is in opposition basically oppose ejecting them. And when they come back in power, they will say, okay, we can do it now. And th I think recently there have been uh, a push down. And I think the place, most of the residential areas around the site has been uh, demolished. I don't know if you're aware of that. I, I am. So what happened, uh, and you, you know this, uh, there were tremendous storms in Ghana uh, this past summer right. where there was a gas station explosion and people died and tremendous flooding too. So that was used as sort of the reason for raising a number of homes. So there were, I think, like 30 to 40 homes that were uh, bulldozed by the site. But there was such uproar from the community that that stopped. So in my speaking with my colleagues there, that and we have a number of photos from this document in it, there were a number of houses that were torn down, but that stopped. The other interesting aspect here is that the World Bank has been getting really involved in this project. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of big businesses that surround this site. And these businesses don't want the site to be there. They would rather have a park for children. And I don't know how that works. Because there's just so much legacy pollution. But um, in my most recent trips to Ghana, I keep on bumping into World Bank officials who are very keen on working with these businesses to do something at the site. So I think that's an interesting dynamic that's going to um, it, it's not going away anytime soon. I'm not sure if you're aware of the World Bank issue, but that adds a, another layer of complexity to the site. But good, good observations, yes. Thank you. I read a really good book a few years ago about the Sydney Tarpon, Sydney Tarpon site in Nova Scotia. Where, and there was a street there, Frederick Street, right next to it that was terribly polluted. Um, just... Deja vu, right? Same sort of things have happened in Nova Scotia that are happening in this area. But, uh, yeah. Um, so have people done, uh, from what I'm hearing, maybe it would be more productive to study the health of people that have lived in that neighborhood yeah. than the, the people that are actually working on the site just because they've had a longer-term exposure? Sure, definitely. And this was, uh, this, this caused a lot of agony for the research team. So in our next five-year grant, there was a number of people who advocated strongly for the community members and a number who advocated very strongly for the workers. Uh, in the end, the funders, IDRC and uh, uh, in the US, Fogarty and NIOSH uh, got together and recommended to us that we focus on the workers. But again, we have a platform to do work. So we're trying to reach out to other funding agencies to join us to now help us expand the scope of the work to look at community members, especially women and children. Uh, coming back to your comment on Nova Scotia, there's a reason why the NIEHS in the U.S., so the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, are really keen, and they're sponsoring a lot of these global e-waste discussions. It's the Superfund program from NIEHS which is involved, because these sites are no different from some Superfund sites, uh, in which you have massive toxic chemical issues, usually in resource-limited settings. You have great social injustices and just like a, a great mix of environmental and social issues. So. They want to get some of the expertise from the Superfund program to try and get on top of this scene before it really balloons out of control. I'm going to ask how in, I'm, I'm curious about the role of organized crime in these sites in other places. And, and is that simply because there's that good money in this? And, and how, how in danger is this site becoming sort of taken over by organized crime. Yeah, great point. So I had dinner last night with a lady who works, I can't remember the acronym, but she does organized crime in the gold mining sector. And they've start, they're starting to investigate the site. Uh, we know in other sites that organized crime is drawn to it because it's a lucrative industry. Um, on one hand, it's on the fringes of being formalized, so legalized, but it's much safer than dealing with drugs and other uh, commodities that are just much more volatile. So there's been, a, we've seen tremendous push from organized crime, especially in uh, Latin America, moving away from drug trafficking to the mining sector. And we're starting to see this in some e-waste sites, like I mentioned, in China, Nigeria, and elsewhere. Uh, in Ghana, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's possible. So I mean, she wasn't sure, and they're looking into it. OK, we are at the end of our time. So thank you very much, uh, Neil. And thanks, everybody, for another great semester.